What I ask the team is don't live in fear, be excited. These are opportunities. We've been given resources and trusted with resources to use them. Hospitals, people, doctors, nurses, food. We're given this stuff with the expectation that we use it. And so we have to use it during a crisis, whether it be man-made or natural. Welcome back to On the Ground with Samaritan's Purse, where we take you to the front lines and behind the scenes of our work around the world. I'm your host, Christy Graham. And today is a special episode. I wanted to bring a conversation that I recently had with my husband, Edward. Edward Graham is the Vice President of Operations at Samaritan's Purse, and he has spent time in every area of the ministry. He travels on behalf of all aspects and sees um, so many of the projects carried out. And so as we entered the new year, I wanted uh, to hear him reflect on 2022, what he saw God do uh, personally, um, and then in, in the work of Samaritan's Purse. And he had great insights um, of what we've been up to um, as an organization. And and I love hearing his heart um, and the way that he's so thankful uh, to see our staff members and volunteers and the sacrifices that they're making on the front lines to serve. Uh, But we don't just talk about 2022. We talk about um, what we're praying and expecting God to do in this new year. So here's our conversation. So I always think it's good to look back, you know, and see what God's done in our lives um, so that we can go forward in obedience. So as we start a new year, we wanted to spend just a few minutes looking back at the last year. You know, what kind of responses did we, did Samaritan's Purse respond to? What did you see on the ground as you traveled? So maybe let's talk about some of the hurricane responses, our work in Ukraine, um, maybe look back at what God did this past year. Yeah. Yeah, I've been here four years now. And so to say that, you know, every year has been different and we learn so much more and we grow, that's an understatement. Mm. It's been quite the ride. But, you know, this year we were coming out of COVID and Samaritan's Purse has been busy. When a lot of ministries and a lot of places in the world were shutting down, that had us hit the accelerator, especially with hospitals and what we could do. So that was that was neat for me to watch. But I was, the exciting part is we started an office in South Korea. And um, I'm excited because I look at what the church in South Korea is always capable of. The church is excited about evangelism, and the and the church there and missionaries have access in places of the world that other missionaries might not. And so just their, where they are with North Korea, where they are in their heart for North Korea, um, also where you see their, their uh, ministry in Mongolia, I'm just excited to be in the office and meet them. And Kenny Isaacs was supposed to go to uh, Iraq, and we were celebrating the final opening of the Azidi project, which mm-hmm. we're also excited about. That's mm-hmm. been some hard work by the team there and the project's team. And this is a greenhouse program in a community where families move in to a community that was built, a community center that acts as a church, but then they have each family will get a, uh, two greenhouses that they can work and grow and have an income. And these are displaced people. And if you remember, this was displaced people that were mm-hmm. horribly affected by the war with ISIS. But Kenny was going there to celebrate it. And I called Kenny and I was like, redirect. Um, I was at the airport uh, coming home. I was like, you go to Poland and see what you can do and and start coordinating with the churches mm-hmm. there. And we have an unbelievable church network there because of Operation Christmas Child. Thousands of churches um, have been doing Operation Christmas Child there. Uh, since the 90s. we got a great network, and um, so Kenny was able to plug right into that. Plus, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association had crusades there not too long ago. Dad's been there, and he's you know he spoke in, this, in the stadium in Lviv. So Kenny takes off over there, and I come home. So one week later, I'm hopping on the DC-8, and I take off with the DART team. And that's what's so amazing. Mm-hmm. There's a war going on. And you see members of the disaster assistant response team come from all over, doctors, nurses, logisticians. They, they sign up with no problem, not knowing what the future was going to be, not knowing how long we could be in Ukraine. But it was determined, based off what I saw in my, from my previous life and talking with Kenny, that we could operate in Lviv. So we set up a hospital there in Lviv in a parking center and a parking garage where we were going to treat patients. And what I saw were the lines at the border were unbelievable. I mean, you're, you're talking people there that were there for days trying to get across. The car line was 14 kilometers long, 14 kilometers of cars just stacked up. People were leaving their cars. The human line at the border was two kilometers long, mass exodus. 
in Europe, you've never seen migration like this due to war since World War II. Um, but here everyone's leaving, and yet our staff are going. Mm-hmm. And they're they're setting up clinics um, there at the they set up a medical clinic there at the train station Lviv because that's where everyone was, and then they would do triage and they would bring people back to the actual hospital. And you're seeing people that were running to, you know, for shelter when the raids were coming in. They're breaking their arms and legs. They haven't been treated for a couple of days. They had concussions, had some, some some blast injuries. But we were doing surgeries there, and. Unbelievable to see the team, but I had to leave. So I left, came back to the States. Um, storms are still happening. Mm-hmm. You got Ukraine mm-hmm. going on. We got hurricanes flooding going on here. North American Ministries is responding. Um, I eventually get back over there. The war has changed. We thought we'd be working in Lviv for two weeks. That we tear down the hospital, move to Poland, be treating in Poland. Didn't happen. So now we're pushing resources mm-hmm. um, further east. One thing that I'm most excited about, but while I was in Lviv that first time, I went and met with churches. Kenny was setting up the hospital. I met with church leaders. I knew because of Operation Christmas Child and the churches, they had the network to be able to feed. I watched the church. Mm-hmm. Our listeners should be so excited about mm-hmm. the church in, in Ukraine because well after we leave, when this war is over, Ukraine will know it was the church that housed them, transported them, and fed them. The churches were being utilized as waypoints. They'd go pick up people at the train station, house them overnight, get them to the border. They would feed them, give them medicine. I wanted to expand on that. I asked the church because I knew with the wars, it gets prolonged now. Food was going to be a huge issue in the East. And the church, along with Kenny Isaacs and the projects team, has been feeding since the start of the war. We're sending metric tons of food each week into the East. And as the cold has come on, as the winter has come, as there's no electricity there, we're getting uh, cooking stoves, warming stoves. Tarping roofs, uh, much like we do here in the U.S., it's the same program. Hurricane comes in, we tarp a roof temporarily. All these roofs had been blown off, and the shelling and the missile strikes, we get roof structures back on in these. So uh, these women, these widows, or these older people will have somewhere to live. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to feed them because they're not leaving. Um, But we're doing it through the church. And that's what I love about it. Well, after Samaritan's Purse leaves, Ukraine will remember it was the church that was there that did not flee that did feed them, uh, just Mm -hmm. like the story of the Good Samaritan. And so I'm proud of the church. So we've expanded on that. We've done medical operations further along the east where I've seen the team. We see the pain and suffering. They want to serve. But again, it's so much more in medicine. Mm -hmm. What I love about the staff is, yeah, they want to meet the immediate needs, just like the story of the Good Samaritan. But the most important part of that story was a debt had to be paid. Mm -hmm. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're there to share the gospel. And so the the team's done an incredible job just in Ukraine. Um, I know I'm talking a lot here. (laughs) It's a lot to recap. It's it's a lot. And you look at, um, you know, last year in Christmas, um, last year I was in um, with the volunteers in Kentucky. Uh, Mayfield, Kentucky was completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. We're still serving there. Mm-hmm. In Mayfield, and as I've gone back several times to Mayfield, and I've watched as this community has slowly rebuilds and homes are being built. We're we've we've rebuilt several homes within downtown, an area because it was completely destroyed. Business, everything downtown was destroyed. Every home, every business, it was completely gone. And I think it's hard for people to understand mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. Imagine a nuclear weapon coming in and destroying a complete city. Um, but we've also bought land, and we're developing community for those that were uninsured and not insured. We're putting them into a new community right across the street, um, right across the bypass of, that goes around the downtown area. So it'll be incorporated into the city. But very few ministries are still there. Very few organizations are still there. Everyone's left Mayfield. Why? The cameras move on. Mm-hmm. The next crisis happens. But our staff is still there serving and loving this community and working alongside the church. And that's what I'm excited about to see the rebuild of Mayfield. Kentucky's been hit hard. Um, Last year, floods happened. We Mm -hmm. served there and we did a rebuild. Flooding again happened this year. I went back to the same communities, same homes that we just rebuilt along the river. We knew the homeowners. They came out and they were like Mm -hmm. smiling. They're like, hey, Luther. Mm -hmm. They knew Luther Harrison by name. They knew our our, um, disaster response team members by name. I'm like Luther. We got to get them higher. We can't. We can't do this again. So Luther and the team, they found land. They purchased land higher, and they're going through. And we'll move part of this community to higher ground. We're still there serving. We haven't left. And that's what our, the theme is for our staff. Where 
I just so encouraged by the love and compassion that our staff and team have had for people to serve those that are hurting in the ditch, Mm -hmm. but to know it's the gospel and I watch them sharing the gospel with these communities in Mayfield. And I can't be more proud of the team Mm -hmm. with all that's going on in the world, with all the disasters, our team, our staff, and our volunteers, they go. They Mm -hmm. go to the sounds of the guns, the, the fire, and it's encouraging to watch. Has it been a busy year? Yes, I've just named a few examples mm-hmm. of of complete disaster and destruction, but our team members are there, and we're still serving. We're still going to be in Ukraine. Uh, we started a country office there. I don't know where we'll leave. We're still serving in both parts of, of um, Kentucky. We're in Florida. Hurricane mm-hmm. hit in Florida. We're serving there in multiple communities, doing a rebuild there. It's challenging. This is the frustrating part. Most of America looks at Florida, and they think— well, these are retirement families. They have money. These are blue-collared family wor- workers from the north that have moved down there, retire, and they're on a fixed income. Mm-hmm. They don't have a backup plan. They have nowhere else to go. Many of them didn't have family there to help and serve them. Our volunteers flooded the area. Mm-hmm. And that's why I love, you know, Proverbs sixteen nine says, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord directs his steps. Mm-hmm. And I love that Samaritan's Purse. Yes, we have plans. I mean, our, our departments are busy. They want to be good stewards. So they make plans. They work hard. But God directs and determines our steps. And then obviously, natural disasters, Samaritan's Purse is a very reactive organization that responds. And so you might have a plan for the year. But a hurricane comes in or a war starts, and it it redirects our focus. And, I, and so I love watching Samaritan's Purse shift and adapt to whatever God needs us to do. So you, you mentioned it a little bit, but the staff, um, and I think, yeah, prior COVID dominated the headlines for years, um, and, and many work stopped for people mm-hmm. around the nation um, and around the world. But Samaritan's Purse actually was busier, but I think medical dominated. And then now we've wa- we walked into Ukraine. That's kind of dominated the headlines. But as you mentioned, every project has been busy. Mm-hmm. North American Ministries, Operation Christmas Child, um, Children's yeah. Heart Project. Our 200 million shoebox is going to be distributed. That's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. 200 million shoeboxes, gospel opportunities. Almost last year alone, 4.5 million kids were registered mm-hmm. into the Greatest Journey with a little under 4 million graduating from the Greatest Journey. For those that don't know what that is, that is a 12-week um a multiple week discipleship program. Those mm-hmm. kids that make decisions for Christ at these shoebox distributions decide to go through this how disciples and teach others about Christ. It's an incredible year for Operation Christmas Child. And it's been huge in Ukraine too. That's where the two hundred million shoebox will mm-hmm. be given. So we're excited about that. But you're absolutely it has been a crazy year. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. um and OCC, Operation Christmas Child whether we're collecting shoeboxes even in Florida during the storm or we're delivering them in a crisis overseas, uh, usually, and because of that network, we can respond quicker. That church network that Operation Christmas Child has developed all over the world, we might not have a projects office there, but we have a church network there. And Jim and his team have done an incredible job of developing that and maturing that. We've got faithful partners. I was on the phone Yesterday, with our friend in Azerbaijan, mm-hmm. um, who's delivering and works in shoeboxes there, and I was there during the war with Armenia with him. He's so encouraging. He's so excited about this season and the church planning, the people coming to Christ. Operation Christmas Child, they've done a great job finding great people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I love, and you, and you mentioned, you know, the staff uh, here at Samaritan's Purse. So I guess, how would you encourage, you know, moving into the new year? Again, we have our plans. We have uh, what we think we're going to do, but God— only God knows, and He yeah. will shape and, and redirect that. So we need to be obedient and willing and surrendered. And I think that is why Samaritan's Purse starts each day in devotions, in God's Word, yeah. praying, asking God, what do you want us to do? So how would you encourage the staff in this upcoming year with so many unknowns looming, but then obviously so many fixed projects we know are going to be carried out like Operation Christmas Child? Yeah. How would you encourage the staff as they, you know, as get God's assignment. Yeah. I would just tell them, hey, the unknown, that's the greatest part. Mm-hmm. Um, what we do know is Scripture, mm-hmm. and we know every word of it's true, and every word of it's God-breathed. And so we know there's uncertainty coming for man, but we know at the end of the day, God wins. Mm-hmm. And so we see, you know, I'm no, I'm no prophet, um, but I read. And I accept by faith that it is true. We're living out revelations and the famines, wars, the rumors of wars. Mm-hmm. It's all coming together, and it's happening more frequently. The world's seeing it all firsthand. They see it live. And so that can, that can breed fear. And what I ask the team is don't live in fear. 
be excited. These are opportunities. We've been given resources and trusted with resources to use them. Hospitals, people, doctors, nurses, food. We're given this stuff with the expectation that we use it. And so we have to use it during a crisis, whether it be man-made or natural, Mm -hmm. and to go love our neighbor. And so I want the staff to be encouraged. These are opportunities, great opportunities to go out and share the gospel. And so I get excited about it. And I get excited because I know each year is going to be different, Mm -hmm. and we don't know what's going to come. And we're like, how are we going to do this? We should live in that that unknown area of we can't do it. Man can't do it. Bob Pierce said, live in God's room, that you plan so big and so bold, it will surely fail if man tries to do it alone. The biggest mistake our staff can do is to throw money at it, to flick a little money at the problem or like, hey, we here, just take this and do what you can. No, that's not what God called us to do. Remember, this is the widow's might that we're entrusted with. She gives us her $20 a month, that's all she can give because she expects us to share the gospel. And she also expects us to be bold. And so we're not living in God's room if we can throw money at it. Uh, that's not planning so big and so bold. We should show up to something like Ukraine and be like, what are we doing? We can't do this. Why are we here? Um, that should be what we're fearful of. But we go forward and we take that step out of the boat because we know God's going to show up. He mm-hmm. called us here. He expects us to be here. And he's going to give us the opportunities to serve. And at the end of the day, we're going to be like, oh, my goodness, mm-hmm. look what he did. To God be the glory. And that's what I want this next year to be about. To God be the glory. You know, the resources, everything we're entrusted with. Um, the other thing I want to encourage the staff is we don't chase storms. We don't go to the next one. We're not going to chase camp. We just because something happens, we're not packing up and moving until we're done. And we need to see it through. You'll hear Kenny say the quality of our work will be the platform of our witness. You'll hear HR say the quality of the people will be our platform of our mm-hmm. witness. Um, at the end of the day, we're entrusted with those in the ditch. God's given us, tells us to go to those people in the ditch. How did we treat them? How do we love on them? How do we serve them? And did we share the gospel with them? Mm-hmm. Were we faithful with the most precious resource of sharing the gospel, and that we can't mess up with. So that's my encouragement to the staff. Be excited about the unknown and share the gospel. Mm -hmm. I know as you were talking, I thought of, you know, the verse, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Mm -hmm. And that is why Samaritan's verse goes. You know, yes, we want to help physical needs to earn the right to share the gospel. But the the reason is the gospel, and that's the goal of Samaritan's verse is, yes, the storms will move on, the headlines will move on, because I think the news, they they pick up a story and they they report it nonstop, and then they move on. But we don't want to move on, and God doesn't move on, and that's why the word of the Lord, it'll stand forever. So if we can share the gospel— plug them in with a local church. And that's what I also love about Samaritan's Purse. You know, we only work with the local church Mm -hmm. because they will be there long-term. They Mm -hmm. are locals. They know the language. They know the culture. Um, So I guess as we look to the new year, obviously God has, he knows what's in store. We don't, uh, but we're going to be faithful and, and, and prepared. What, what are you looking forward to? What are some of the I guess, is there anything that you're looking forward to? Yeah. Well, I'm excited. So Samaritan's Purse, you know, we're we're heavy into aviation. I mm-hmm. say heavy, you know, compared to some organizations, we're tiny. But Dad loves aviation and has seen the need for it. And I'm I'm 100% bought in just because of my background. It allows us to get there quickly, dictate our response, our timeline. Um, we can resupply when we want. So we've had the DC-8 aircraft, and it's flown almost every week since the war has started in Ukraine. We have purchased another 757. This is a pure cargo plane. Hmm. The DC-8 is a combi. It's three-quarters cargo, and the and the last third is passenger. The 757 will be pure cargo. Between those two aircraft, hmm. that's a lot of supplies that we can get into Ukraine. But what also allows us to do is to deploy to different directions. So there can be a crisis in Europe, and there can be a crisis in the Pacific, and yet Samaritan's Purse can respond in both locations. Um, I'm excited about that. Mm-hmm. Our mission aviation services has continued to grow. We house that out of Greensboro, North Carolina. The team has done an incredible job. D- to think about how old that, that DC-8 was built in the 60s. Dad likes a good bargain, a good deal, and he mm-hmm. loves older aircraft. But that aircraft went under heavy maintenance last Christmas. Well, this second aircraft allows us to be able to deploy and to be and to be more prudent with the widow's might and to be more cautious, and but also to invest. And so I'm excited about what MAS is doing there. The fact that they've kept that DC-8, once it came out of maintenance, flying constantly is a testament to the maintenance program, the pilots, the team down there. Kudos, like 
your listeners just don't understand mm -hmm. what an incredible accomplishment is they've done, but they couldn't do that alone. God has allowed that plane to fly. We need to get that 757 in and flying mm -hmm. too. Um, I would like to. I don't need to see it. God had, knows what we need, but it's going to be exciting to watch that grow. Um, I'm real excited. We mentioned about South Korea. It's coming on board. Their ministry, what they're doing with op Operation Christmas Child, um, Children's Heart Project. Kids will be going there for, for surgeries with mm -hmm. the hospital connections. I'm excited to see that. Um, you know what? I'm also excited. I told you a story. I want to meet the people and while we're in the field. So I was in um, – in Florida, and I go around and ask everyone, where are you from? How'd you hear about this? And I was talking to this young girl, and she's like, well, I, I was on the deer stand, and I got a notification on my phone mm -hmm. that I could deploy with Samara's Purse, and she was on her deer stand in Maine. Well, I was kind of interested. I'm a hunter. This is a, a young girl, and you don't expect to hear a young girl talk about deer hunting. And uh, so I was like, all right, she's already throwing everything out the window that I assumed about her. And then she's like, well, I heard about it at Prescription for Renewal. She had come to our medical conference for Prescription for Renewal. Then she told me that she'd actually been with World Med twice to Togo. <laughs> I'm like, well, this is incredible. Like, you're doing it all. And I was like, well, I was like, I wish I'd met you sooner. And she's like, well, we met in Ukraine. Now I feel like an idiot because now she was at the hospital at Ukraine. But here's a girl that she's wearing like about every shirt you can wear at Samaritan's Purse. She has a full-time job that she does, but she – she took a um, a traveling nurse job so she could travel more with us mm -hmm. and dictate her schedule. She's all in on the mission of Samaritan's Purse, mm -hmm. whether it be volunteering, whether it be on the DART Disaster Assistant Response Team, Operation Christmas Child, North American Ministries Responding to Crisis. Where does God find these people and bring them to us? We don't deserve them. And so that's what I'm excited about when I go out. and I want to see God working. Mm -hmm. And people like this girl, this young girl, we get the best. And we don't deserve it. So mm -hmm. this year, I look forward to the unknown, who I'm going to meet, mm -hmm. and I look forward to seeing how the guy's going to use this additional aircraft and to get us in those opportunities to serve mm -hmm. where no one else can go. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love this podcast. I mean, we are all over the world. We are in over 100 countries, and we have affiliate offices, country offices, yeah, volunteers that live and serve all over. Um we are the body of Christ. I mean, we couldn't do what we do without the ear, the eye. You know, no no one's more important. I mean, so maybe just how would you encourage somebody listening? Huh, what do I do? How do I get involved? And what could I do? Yeah, you Right now, you can go to SamaritansPurse.org, and you can go, and it'll say a little pull-down banner. How do I get involved? Mm -hmm. Now, there's ways to volunteer. It'll say where we are deploying right now with NAM, whether it be a current crisis and we're doing actual mm -hmm. disaster relief, and there will be rebuild opportunities there. I think it's always good to look back, but then look forward expectantly to what God's going to do in 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love talking with Edward and just hearing the many different uh, areas of the ministry. And it it just both of us, we were just astounded at the way that God is using um, unique skills of many of our staff members and the way that they are truly called to service. This isn't a job. Uh, this is a calling. And it, we're just blessed to be able to see them carry out God's work around the world. And like Edward said earlier, um, I think it's easy, you know, for the church to take an attitude of despair, you know, and wonder why things happen. You know, they are ministering to really hurt, hurting and broken people when disasters like Hurricane Fiona hit Puerto Rico, uh, homes are destroyed in Florida, the war rages in Ukraine. Uh, but I think it's exciting to watch the churches around the world that we work with, that they're focusing on God and that He is in the midst of these hardships, and God has allowed us to serve, and it's truly a privilege uh, to watch Samaritan's Purse uh, be so committed to the gospel and meet people in their brokenness and share the good news and the hope that we have in Jesus. Um, and, and the work we do is modeled after the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. You know, it is not about physically helping people. That's a part of it. Uh, but the story and, and the point of the, the message is that we are called to um, rescue them spiritually. Um, and that is what Jesus does. He, he came to save and, and rescue us and pay the debt that we couldn't pay. And so I loved hearing his heart, hearing his story. Um, I, I encourage you to continue praying for the work of Samaritan's Purse. Again, we, we talked about it a lot. You know, we don't know what 2023 holds, uh, but we trust in God 
uh, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Uh, we trust in Him. He knows what's coming. And I, and I believe He has prepared um, everyone working at Samaritan's Purse. He's prepared us because we surrender each and every day uh, to His direction and, and what He wants for our lives. And so um, we're excited to see what He has, but we, we pray that we will be faithful you know, to proclaiming the gospel and remembering why we are serving. It is in Jesus' name. Uh, I encourage you to join our community on Instagram at on the ground SP to be able to see a lot of the behind the scene contents of the posts or the episodes that we're bringing in the new year. Thank you again for listening and joining us and praying uh, for the work of Samaritan's Purse. We couldn't do it without you. God bless you. <laughs>